blessing to be able to talk about the fulfillment of the law and the different aspects of the law and how it plays into New Testament living. And we know from scripture and Jesus teaching as well as Paul that as we walk in love, we fulfill the duties, if you will, the, the commandments, the law. We know that man took the 10 commandments and created 613 additional laws um, and they are intended to expound upon and give detail to what God had in mind. But the bottom line is when you sizzle it down, kind of like if you take uh, an, an ore, you know, take gold, take silver, it's surrounded by a lot of stuff. But as you apply heat to it, all the dross, all the, the impurities melt away and you get the pure gold, the pure silver. Well, when you sizzle down the law, what you get is pure love. That's what God had in mind when he made those commandments. So let's walk through prayerfully to finish this up. So as we said, the law fulfilled is what we're talking about, right? Let's look at Colossians. I think this was the one verse I didn't, scripture I didn't get when I was wrapping up last week. So I'm going to throw this in. So we move to our next Colossians 2. It's a long passage, so you can read it more thoroughly at your leisure. But I'm going to just give you the intent of it, hopefully. In Colossians 2, I'm in the New King James Version, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In him, you were also circumcised. Let me just stop right there. When you look at Old Testament uh, tradition, laws, rules, you will see that God instituted the, the uh, process of circumcising every male in the household of faith. So that when Abraham was um, with God initially, it was even before that came along, but then eventually he told him to circumcise everybody. Um, painful process, thank God I don't have to go through that, but it was intended to be a foreshadow of what we're dealing with now, which is circumcision of the heart. What is circumcising to represent? Peeling away the flesh, peeling away that which is carnal, that which is temporal, that which is based on um, our humanity, if you will. Um, I have been recognizing that over and over as you meditate on text in the Old Testament, we, you know, we, we've always taught this, but it's like become more alive as you see the, the one, the nexus between one and another. You know, as I said, in the Old Testament, he said, take away the foreskin, the, the covering of the, the male body part that, you know, sort of, if you will, represented the flesh. Whereas in, in scripture, in New Testament, he's saying, take away that callousness of your heart, that, that foreskin, that dead skin that is covering up your heart and keeping you from being pure before me so that you can live a heart, uh, live with a heart of, of purity. Um, and the word does that. It strips away the old. It strips away um, the uh, carnal, if you will, so that your heart is pure toward God. Uh, so in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So as I die to myself and put away my fleshly ways, that's the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. And we had a conversation on whosoever believes just the other day talking about baptism. Baptism does not save us, we know. It is a symbolic outpouring or reflection of what has happened on the internal part of us. Once I've given my heart to Christ, I've died to my old nature. Baptism represents the process through which I'm submerged in water 
according to scripture, to reflect that I've died to my old self and I'm raised up in Christ Jesus. It does not save me, but it is a process. It's a right, R-I-T-E, that God instituted so that we would honor him. And we're putting the devil on notice, every demon in hell, every angel, every being that is connected to us that I died to that old self. And so it's symbolic, but it's still important. God said, Matthew 28, Jesus said, go make disciples and baptize them. So it's not something that you treat lightly. Once you've given your heart to Christ, your next step, if you have not been baptized, then I encourage you to do that if you've given your heart to Christ. Because if you haven't, you're just going to go down a wet uh, dry center and come up a wet center. But if you've given your life to Christ, there is a symbolic symbolism, but it's also, I believe, a spiritual element that God honors that act of obedience. Okay. Um, 12, verse 12, buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your tres trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Lord have mercy. The big piece of that is when you died to yourself and was were raised in the spirit realm with him as a living creature, he forgave all your sins. Everything you ever did that dishonored God is forgiven in Christ. So that old self, including that old sins, got buried. They are no longer associated with you. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed your transgressions from you. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwritten handwriting of requirements that was against us. You know, the law told us where we erred. So in a sense, it was against us in that sense that it uh, caused us to see our, our sin, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principality, you know, every accusation of the enemy, every attack of the enemy, the enemy does not have authority over me as a child of God. He has triumphed over the enemy in dying for every sin of mankind and being resurrected by the Father. And so the power, when he got up, he said, all power and authority is in my hand. And he said, Whatever power the enemy now has is counterfeit. When I say that, it's, it's like a thief, a person who has stolen from, have, who has taken advantage of, who has used what isn't his lawfully. And he uses people. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in, in it. So when I speak in the name of Jesus, I speak in the authority that he has given me the in that he triumphed over those principalities and those demonic forces and those unclean spirits. So I have that authority in Christ. And we're not going to get into that. But let's just go with the fact that he triumphed. He, death could not hold him down. He had victory and has the victory. And we have the victory in Christ. And that's why when I find myself in a spiritual uh, battle, I can say, devil, you got to go because you are trespassing on holy ground. This child is a child of God. You have no authority in her life or his life. And therefore, you got to go. But like I said, I ain't going to get into that. <laughs> Let me keep it moving because you know I get caught up in that thing. Okay. So verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbath. Somebody said, well, what about the other rules and the other laws? And this is what he's speaking to. Yes, there's a lot of things that um, people have uh, been required to do because of those rules and regulations. But we were set free from those. We don't have to be bound by those. We, in, in uh, New Testament terms, all things are permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial for me. In other words, I can choose, as some do, choose to follow certain rules and regulations and patterns that they learned from scripture. You know, how to eat kosher and 
uh, different things. But it doesn't mean that I have to do that because I've been set free from that. When go back to Peter and Acts, when, when Peter was up on the roof praying and um, he was told that uh, Jesus, the Lord dropped the sheep down and, and showed him all these animals by Jewish standards, they were unclean. And God said, don't call anything I made unclean. So it might not be a healthy thing for me to eat pork, but it doesn't mean I can't eat pork, right? It might not be healthy for my heart. It might not be a good idea for me to uh, even steak. Too much of it is not good. You know, so all things may be permissible. I might have the freedom to do them, but they might not be what's wise. So think on the rules and the regulations. We we aren't going to let anybody judge us because we didn't keep the Sabbath the way they think we should. Uh, but we do want to honor the Sabbath because it's a day that God modeled before us. But he said, let no one judge you by that. So you should have a day of rest. Your day might not be the same as mine, but you should have a day that you set aside to honor God and, and uh, worship God and, and quiet your soul and, and have some rest. That's what God did. If he did it, Lord knows we need it. If he only works six days, then who in the world is better than him? But verse 16, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things that which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. In essence, we're not going to get caught up. You know, you got a whole lot of people now that are into worshiping angels, just like they were back then. Uh, people who are caught up in crystals and all kinds of things that they're allowing to be as treated them as deity. But we're not going to allow that to happen. The bottom line is, because of time, I'm not going to try to unpack every single word, because as you can see, this is a very rich verse. But the essence of it comes down to this. What did he say? That it is from God. All things are knit together by joints and ligaments. What are you talking about? The body of Christ. All of us together are, are uh, holding fast to the head, he said in verse 19. Who is the head? Christ Jesus, the head of his body. We're holding fast. We're knit together as joints, as ligaments. Each one of us has a part, as we know in 1 Corinthians 12. Everybody has different gifts and calls. But the bottom line is he holds us all together. And so we're not doing what we do to, as the Old Testament saints did, uh, get approval, get uh, released from any guilt, um, offering pigeons and Rams and all the things they had to do to keep getting their consciences cleansed from their sin. We are not bound by any of that. Jesus died once for all. And so now as part of his body, we are not bound by those rituals anymore. And to the extent that we choose to celebrate them, that's our freedom. But it's not something that we're bound by. I am a stickler in this. As I said, with the Sabbath, my uh understanding of the text is that mine might I might celebrate the Sabbath on a different day. Now we know we come together on some Sunday, every Sunday to worship our God because we believe He rose on Sunday. But I'm saying to have your time of peace, your time of quiet, your time where you allow yourself to get in God's face and just be with Him. That day might be different from you than somebody else. And Paul is saying don't let anybody judge you for that. Verse 20 says, therefore, if you die with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why is though living in the world? Do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concerns things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Because the Pharisees were classic. They will always be, why didn't you, uh, people 
Why do they eat on uh, food on the Sabbath? Why are they picking corn on the Sabbath? Why didn't they ceremonially wash their hands? All those things were merely rituals that guided us to Christ. He's the fulfillment, so we no longer have to do that. As he said, once the bridegroom is here, we don't have to worry about preparing for him anymore. He's here now. I hope I'm making sense. In other words, uh, those commandments and doctrines were all guiding us toward Christ. And that's why you see where it talks about the fact that it's a shadow of the things to come. Uh, some say it like this, the Old Testament concealed what the New Testament revealed. Even the way that the tabernacle was set up, it was a foreshadow of the heavenly tabernacle that we'll experience when we go to heaven. So all these things are foreshadows. Are, 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 uh, it's like you have a vision showing you something that is yet to come. It's the same principle. So when we don't take a touch, we don't get caught up in these regulations because we are free of them. As long as we are following the example of Christ and walking in love, we're fulfilling the key duties. And those other things kind of take care of themselves, if that makes sense. They're not something that we need to worry about. So very strict Jewish people still eat, only eat kosher. But as we know from what he told Peter, get up, kill, and eat. So we're free to eat. Now, does it make sense for me to eat everything? No, because it may not be healthy for me, but I'm free to eat. So, all right. Look at verse 20, 21. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concerns things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Now bear in mind, some of this was specifically being spoken about because of the false doctrines that were being taught in the country where he was teaching in Colossae. So there were certain things he's saying that would have meant more specifically to them because of the particular false doctrines that were being taught there. Um, but the bottom line is for our sake, the generic rule is what I'm trying to pull out. And you can do some digging and you'll find that um, there was a lot of Gnosticism being taught there. Um, Gnosticism is all about knowledge. Uh, and the more knowledge I have was helping me to, to be uh, more, what's the word I want, accepted by God. Maybe that's the best way I could put it. Um, when I am trying to do it in my flesh, I'm trying to do it whether it's because I'm building my knowledge up and my understanding and my wisdom so I can sound intellectual or whether I'm denying my flesh so I can seem super spiritual. If any of it is based on my effort, it is a works-based process. It's a religion. When I'm in Christ, my righteousness is always based on my receiving Jesus as my savior. Anytime I start listing, if I ask you, are you going to heaven? You start telling me all the things you do. Well, I read my Bible. Well, I pray. Well, I try to be nice to people. All of that says that you're trying to earn your way into heaven. The only answer that you can give me that's adequate when I say, are you saved is, I've accepted Jesus as my savior. Jesus already died for all my sins. So I'm not trying to work my way into heaven, right? I'm not trying to seem so super spiritual that, that you know, I do things like, you know, fast for 20 days to prove how spiritual I am. I've done a 40-day fast, but it was because I wanted to do it, to die to my flesh a little more so I could hear God better. And God knows it was a phenomenal experience. But it wasn't to get saved. It wasn't to prove something to God. I'm already saved. God already loves me. I don't have nothing, to, anything I got to prove to God. Let me keep it moving. I'm acting like I got all day. 
But let me just read this to you. Gnostics replace faith with intellect. Gnosticism followed the Greek philosophy that matter was inherently evil. Only non-physical spiritual realities were good. So all of that, again, is a, a, a works-based mindset. If I am doing anything that says I'm earning my salvation, then I'm not basing it on faith. And God wants me to base my salvation strictly on my faith in him and his son's death, death burial, and resurrection for my sin. So there were a lot of uh, legalistic teachings going on in this area. All these things that you see that might sound like, why is he saying that? Dig a little deeper and you'll find that he was addressing specific teachings that were being taught at that time in Colossians. Okay. So all of these things I read were to help you understand that the law falls into this category of works. Anytime I have to do something to beyond placing my faith in Christ, to know that I'm saved, keeping the rules, keeping a certain way. I can only do this on the Sabbath. I can only do that on the Sabbath. Now, do I want to honor God and rest on the Sabbath? Yes, because he told me to. But he's not going to strike me dead. Go back when, when they said, well, why do your servants pick, pick corn on the Sabbath? He said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God created the Sabbath to help us out. But the Sabbath isn't our God. You know, he didn't make us for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath to help us, if that makes sense to you. So Jesus was letting us know we shouldn't be judging anybody by the Sabbath. So there are many good things in the law. You know, eating healthy is a good thing, but it's not to get saved. It's not to be pure. It's just because it's a good thing if I choose to do it. Okay. Now, you know, you can put your notes, your questions in the chat anytime. We go along in this lesson. Um, and you can also put prayer requests in the chat anytime we go along in this lesson, because we always want to pray at the end and touch and agree with you in prayer. We have a prayer wall as well. I'm sure somebody will post it in the prayer uh, in the chat where you can post your prayer requests because people from around the world join us in prayer on that prayer wall. But feel free to uh, put your questions at the end. We'll try to address it. So, this kind of speaks again to just the whole concept of trying to satisfy anything legalistically, rule-wise, regulation-wise, in order to make ourselves better in God's sight. That's not God's will. We do what God told us to do, and that is fulfill the law by loving one another. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more. Okay, so the heart of faith. You know, one of the things that's interesting, we are harder on Christians seemingly than we are on non-believers. People who are not Christians, we'll give them a pass. We're like, well, you know, they going through this or they going through that and maybe they made a mistake or whatever. If a Christian does the same thing, oh, they supposed to be a Christian. They should know better. And we're just harsher. I'm even convinced even in marriage, when believers get married, we are so much more strict toward each other because we say, oh, well, you know what the Bible says. And of course we know what the Bible says. But that doesn't mean we should still grow, show each other grace. So I want to talk a little bit about just what it means to, Fulfill the law when it comes to each other as Christians. First of all, it reflects that we know God. Look at 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Verse 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I love him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, 
truly the love of God is perfect in him. By this, we know that we are in him. Verse six, he who says he abides in him or himself ought to walk as just as he walked. So what is it telling us? If I love you, if you love me, he said, keep my commandments. It's uh, God's will that we walk in love. And it reflects that we really know him when we walk in love. When we say, oh, I love you, but we do nothing behind that, nothing that reflects that. That's merely just saying a bunch of words. You got a lot of people who walk around and say, oh, I love you, I love you. But there's no demonstration. There's no proof in the pudding, so to speak. Love is not just a feeling. It's an action word. It should be reflected in our attitudes, our actions toward one another. So I'm going to challenge us, including me, because this word is always challenging, because I believe our flesh has to continue to die to live this word out. Uh, that if we're going to really walk as Jesus walked, which is what this word is telling us in verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself ought to walk just as he walked. Our, our flesh has to be stripped away. We have to say, you know what, Lord? Not my will, your will be done. I yield, have your way in me, guide me, show me how you would have me to walk this thing out. Keeping a loving attitude, keeping a loving approach in every situation. I've got to let him strengthen me to do that and yield myself. I believe, and this is the theory of Betty Carr, the struggle is we want our own way. We want to say we love God and we want to say we'll follow him. But we want our own way. We want it the way we want it to be, no matter what it might be. And so as long as I'm trying to get my way, one of our ways isn't going to work. If he's going to be the one that's leading the way and I'm following him, then I got to say, I'll do it your way. Even when my flesh don't want to. And most people get off the boat right there because they're like, well, I ain't feeling that. What kind of love is God asking us for? Agape love. What's agape love? Unconditional. Uh, phileo love, friendship love, typically is more based on, as well as other forms, I'm going to get what I want. And as long as you give me what I want, then I'll give you what you want. Kind of a quid pro quo, we call that in the law. But agape love is, let me see what's best for you. Let me see what's most beneficial for you. It's not even about what I'm going to get in return. It's how can I bless you? How can I look out for you? Most of us are like, yeah, but who won't look out for me? And you have to grow up into agape love. You have to die to self another level to walk in agape love because it's not about what am I getting? It's about what is that person in need of? How can I show them love? How can I help them to be what God created them to be? That's what agape love is about. It's a selfless love. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old, old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you which which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. What's he saying? We know the scripture says in Christ, in him, there's no darkness at all. So when you talk about darkness, you're talking about spiritual darkness, a separation from God, not living your life in accordance with the light. He is light. And so when we walk in light, we walk in love. So I can't say I'm in love, walking in love, walking in the light. And I say, I hate you. Something wrong with that. When you see the word brother, you know, in first John, this John who was the apostle that often referred to, we refer to as the apostle that Jesus loved. Of course, he was the youngest. And there's a lot of discussion about why Jesus said that. Kind of like a 
the baby of the bunch. But the bottom line is, he taught much about love. And he talks about brethren, you, me, those who are in Christ, how we are to love one another. I can't say I hate you if I am walking in love. That shows darkness in my heart. You know, the scripture talks about how you should never let a bitter root take root in your heart. You know how you harbor some anger and bitterness and 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 uh, hatred or even just enough uh, anger towards somebody. It'll begin it'll begin to take root in your heart and become like a bitterness, and your tone, your attitude will reflect that. Not only toward that person, it says that bitter root will grow up to defile many. That means that it will taint your other relationships and what you're doing. That's why you know. You go to work and be mad at everybody and, and they don't know what you're going through, but you're really mad at the person at home because that bitter root will defile everything you touch. And so that hatred, you don't want to let it grow in your heart. You want to renounce it. You want to ask God to help you to forgive that person and move on to love that person. He said, love your enemies. You know what I mean? It's not even just your brother, but all the more your brother that you forgive them if you need to forgive them. Love them so that you can move on in life and not let that bitterness take root and so that you're walking in darkness because you can't walk in light and dark. They just don't have fellowship. One of them got to give and light will overtake darkness. So if you find yourself in a place where you feel certain kinds of ways towards somebody, go in prayer. Talk to God about it. Pour your heart. Get some counseling about it if you must. But get it out of your heart. Don't let somebody take root. Some bitterness take root in your heart and ruin your life and ruin your ability to enjoy who you are in Christ. Because that's exactly what it'll do. Not to mention, as I said, just taint every other relationship. Now, he talked about a new commandment. I'm not giving you a new commandment. It's the same one from the beginning. Well, what was the one from the beginning? Go back to John 3, 13. Jesus gave a commandment. When he talking about the beginning, he talking about the beginning of the faith in Christ. 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the new commandment that Jesus gave. Love one another. He didn't say, you know, read your Bible 1,200 times, although you can do that, and obviously it'll help you to love each other. But the bottom line is, it's a command. It's not even a suggestion. It's not even just a good idea. God commands us to love our brother and love our sister. Look at chapter 15 right there in the book of John and verse number 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Think about that. How has Jesus loved you? Unconditionally. Agape love was demonstrated when he laid down that his life for your sin on that cross when he died, when he hung. All of that was about your needs, not his. He was perfect already. He needed to die for his sin because he had none. It was about my need, your need, and every other person's need. That was unconditional. He wasn't looking to get something back. He was giving. That's what agape love does. It's about looking out for the needs of others. If you look at verse 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, than, a, than to lay down one's life for his friend. So when Jesus uh, when, when John tells us in 1 John 7, 11, that we are to do what he did and to love the way he did and to walk the way he did, he's challenging us to be able to lay down our lives for one another uh, and to do, I'm sorry, not in 11, back in verse 6, pardon me, when I read, he who says he abides in him uh, himself also to walk just as he walked. How did he walk? Sacrificially, looking out for the needs of others, looking for opportunities to bless others, praying for, you know how Jesus walked, healed the sick, raised the dead, prayed for people, fed people. All those things is how he walked and he wants us to walk the same way. 
most of us are so busy looking to see what somebody's going to do for us that we can't walk in agape love. We walk in selfish love. That's lust. And watch this. Agape love is not Christian love. Agape love is not based on feelings, feeling warm and fuzzy. I may not feel warm and fuzzy today, but that doesn't mean I can't demonstrate love in my approach and my attitude toward others. Look at Romans 12 and 10. Romans 12, 10. Let's see here. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. So again, I'm looking out for your needs. I'm looking out for your well-being, giving preference to you. That's what it means to walk in agape love. And I have found that God is a God who honors his word. He said, give and it shall come back to you, press down. A good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. When I pour out love, God pours back in. He uses others, but he also just blesses my life through various means to let me know he loves me. So you will never be left loveless if you're pouring out love. You, If you're only looking for a get, 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 then nine times out of ten, you'll never be satisfied. But there is a blessing in giving. Romans 14, 13, what does that say? Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve not to put a stumbling block or as a cause of fall in our brother's way. So I'm not going to put up a, a barrier of any sort. I'm going to extend love and grace instead of judgment towards you. Uh, see, we will judge somebody and then decide we don't have to love them because they did so and so. Or they they ain't this whoever we think they're supposed to be. So therefore, I'm justified in not treating them the way they want to be treated. Or I'm justified in not loving them the way they, you know, I know I can love them. But that's not God. God says, love your brother. And if he offends you, forgive your brother. How many times? 70 times, seven if necessary. That means over and over and over and over again. And most of us say, well, I forgive, but I ain't forgetting. Is that the way Jesus loves you? He said, love as I love you. Does, do you want him remembering your sin? Right? Think about that. If you say, oh, I'm not going to forgive what they did, I'll forgive them. Jesus said, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. What if he said, well, okay, I forgive, but I ain't going to forget your sin. I don't need any records in heaven <laughs> of the jacked upness of my life. I need him to forget all about that. In seriousness, if we're going to use his as the standard, then we have to do it his way. And he said, love as I have loved. So he doesn't judge me and then decide he doesn't love me. He loves me unconditionally. He shows me mercy and grace. Thank you, Jesus. Look at chapter 15 in Romans. Verse 7, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Isn't it easy to reject, easy to come up with reasons why somebody's not good enough to be in your circle? Reasons to be able to shun somebody because they don't fit into your mode or they don't seem at your standard, whatever. We come up with all kind of craziness. We act as though somehow we are, we are greater than we are. We forget our stuff is just as bad as others, but we just make it look prettier. And so we convince ourselves it's not that bad. But the truth is we all sin and mess up. We all fall short of God's glory. And therefore, we should accept each other. We should receive each other. 
verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brother, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Isn't it something that somebody will believe in you, give you the benefit of doubt? You know, maybe I make a mistake. Maybe I don't get it right. But if you think of me and, and assume good things about me and assume that I mean to do well, even when I mess up, your attitude toward me is going to be different. You can be like Paul. He said, I know there's goodness in you. You're full of goodness. You know, even I don't see it, keep speaking that thing as though, as it were, uh, perhaps, what do you say? Speak those things as, that are not as though they were. Keep calling forth the goodness in me. I was at a, a home run service and a teacher who was um, being memorialized had a reputation of being tough. But she was able to take some of the students that nobody else could do anything with and turn their lives around. And they come back to her to say, thank you for being so loving. Doesn't mean love is always mushy. It might be kind of tough to challenge me to do better. But it says, I believe in you. I know there's greatness in you. I know you can do this. And it encourages me. So even when I fall short, it doesn't write me off. That's what, when you love, you're not going by how you feel about what I did. You're going about doing what you do because of who you are in Christ and what the word of God tells us to do. What else does it tell us? Look at 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5. We want to encourage each other. There's some people you get around, they always trying to make you feel better about yourself, trying to encourage you, help you, to keep your head up. Those are the people you enjoy being around. And I always point out your fault, not always putting you down, not always telling you where you messed up. Not to say, again, we, yes, iron shoppings are, we encourage each other to be our best. So, yes, we challenge each other. But it should also be that we encourage each other. Verse 11, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. So uh, one version in, in, translates this edify as encourage. Build up. Uh, speak positive. Speak life. Help me to see my better days are coming. Help me to know I can do better but I'm okay as I am. You love me and you see goodness in me as I am because all of us fall short. None of us are perfect. I don't care how much we think we might be or how much we've convinced others we might be. Take a look, a sober and look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. You ain't all that. One of the things that's real funny is when you see people on TV and they're criticizing their spouse and how Especially, hate to say it, but it's a lot of times men talking about how fat she got and she, she had the baby. And I'm looking at this dude like, dude, have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> how you going to criticize her? At least she had some babies. What's your excuse? <laughs> no, but seriously, it's like we can see the flaws in everybody else, but let's speak life. Let's edify. Let's build up. Let's encourage each other. Those are ways we show love. Here's another one. Look at Galatians 6 and 2. Bearing one another's burdens. Not trying to be a burden, but looking for ways to bear one another's burden. And that's not to say if you have a struggle, hey, share it. Because people who love you are going to try to help you as best they can. But look for opportunities to lift somebody else's burden. Be a blessing to somebody else. Galatians 6 and 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You want to know what being under the law is? This is part of being under the law. Bear each other's burdens. What does that mean? If I can be a blessing to you, if I can help you get through what you're going through. Uh, I heard a testimony today about my first lady's son who had gone out to brunch. He said he was in Baltimore. Somebody paid for his meal. He was with two other couples. They didn't pay for theirs. <laughs> and then he said he asked the lady 
who told him the server, you know, who paid? She said, well, they told me not to tell you, but and she was like, you know, so he said he made his way over there and just asked. And they said, well, your mom prayed for me when I had cancer. And she helped me get through that thing. And so I promise that whenever I see one of y'all, wherever you are, I will definitely be a blessing to you because she blessed me so much. She carried that woman's burden. She took that heaviness of that cancer before the Lord, prayed with her, interceded for her. And so God gave that woman a burden now to be a blessing to that family because of how much it blessed her. First lady got a million other things to do. She could have easily said, I don't have time for that. But she consistently prayed with that lady. And that lady remembers that. That's carrying each other's burdens. It's not, it's not just, oh, I can, you know, physically come and do something for you, which if you can, praise God. But sometimes it's just taking the time to hear somebody's heart, pray with them, encourage them, let them know God's got you. You're going to get through this thing. And I'm going to walk through it with you. You know, when my friend, one of our reverends fell and broke her leg and ooh, it was ugly, I went immediately to the hospital and when she, you know, I served her communion. I, when she got out, I took her to, you know, doctor's uh, visit. That's burning each other's burdens, doing what we can to help each other. Um, love fervently, Peter says. Look at first Peter. One and two, one and twenty-two. Pardon me. Look at First Peter one and twenty-two. Since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. You have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the spirit. I gave my heart to Christ. I purified my soul. I'm surrendering my will to his will. So he's saying, since you did that, now what's the next thing? Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Not judging, not rejecting, not putting down, not esteeming one higher than the other because of their position by showing fervent love toward one another. When people feel love, that draws them to Christ. It's one thing if you can tell me intellectually how to accept Christ. It's another thing when you demonstrate love toward me. You know, we've had the blessing of being able to sow into different situations when people are going through different things. It blesses me to be able to do that because a is more blessed to give than to receive. But B, it's a blessing to know that you can be a blessing to somebody. And that then opens their heart all the more to hear the gospel. You know, we we, for example, last Christmas, I don't know how many things we ended up being a part of, honestly, because I I trolled the people. <laughs> I put it on my Facebook page. I put it on whosoever believes. I did everything but beg. Can you please help me support the Marion House? We bought so many things the ladies needed, all kinds of um, appliances and clothes and toiletries. And we just bombarded them with gifts because God put it on my heart to be a blessing. The Marion House is a place for transitioning women who may be coming out of prison or other difficult situations. It blessed me tremendously to see them go blessed. I, I didn't have to do that. We didn't have to do that. Those who gave uh, collectively with us didn't have to do it. That's fervent love. It's not about my needs. It's not about what's convenient for me. It's about loving others and looking out for what they need. That's what fervent love looks like. Be hospitable. Look at First Peter right there, 4 and 9. Can I tell you, this is an area I had to really, really prayerfully grow in because I, I didn't um, know all of the ins and outs of it. You know, as a, as a child growing up, I, 
I had to really learn this whole concept. Look at verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So if somebody comes by, has a need, uh, or you're in a position where you can make people feel welcome, do it. You know, I heard a lady talk about how she joined the board of directors. She was the only African-American woman invited to be a part of this board of directors. And when she walked in, everybody was so stiff. She said, but I'll never forget the one lady, a Caucasian woman, came over to me, greeted me, made me feel so welcome. They became friends. Um, and to this day, she remembers that with so much joy because she was so hospitable toward her. You know, it's not even just your home, although you want to be hospitable in your home and make it a welcome place. But wherever you are, you know, you see somebody struggling, you see somebody feeling awkward. Maybe you're in a class and they come in late and, you know, nobody's kind to them. You've seen those movies where the kid is awkward or maybe they're new in town and all the other kids turn their nose up. But there's that one child who takes the moment to say, hey, he, you can sit by me at lunch or hey, you can be my friend. Those little things can mean a lifetime of change for somebody. Um, you never know how your choices will have long-term effect. We want to always preach the gospel, but as Fred, uh, what is his name? St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. You know, preaching the gospel ain't just opening your mouth. It's how you live, how you make me feel, how you treat me. Um, and be hospitable without grumbling, you know, without, you know, I, I can remember walking into one church one time years ago, and I, I, I vowed I'd never go back. I ended up going back when they got a new pastor, but I just remember walking in, I was visiting, the time had changed. So I was thinking it was one time and it was really another. So I'm thinking it's 11, it's 10. Uh, Cause I didn't set my clock properly, so I'm walking in late. The ushers was so unfriendly, um, and it just felt so cold in there spiritually that I thought to myself, "What kind of church is this?" Uh, because it just did not make me feel welcome. And being warm, being um, kind this is an article i see on found online um and it says true hospitality is a practice but when you truly experience warm hospitality you are made to feel loved and welcome no matter the mess you may feel your life or home is you are just invited to come um and and there's something about a person who uh, just takes the time to pay attention. You know, maybe you're in a crowded room and you see that one person who seemingly feels awkward or seems like they don't feel like they fit in. Um, and they just list some things. Bring cookies to the doctor's office. Make cookies or cards with your kids to share with neighbors. Schedule a monthly time where you will have someone over. Invite a friend to coffee. Write a snail mail card to someone. Send a gift card. Open the door for people. Host a play date. Say a kind word on a social media post. Smile. Do you know smiling is huge? Like can make such a difference in somebody's day. Um, there's an old adage that says you might be the only uh, Bible someone ever reads. Um, and you and, and when they say that, that means when you are, excuse me, um, taking the time to show Christ, to show love, because of that warmth, you may then let them see a real live version of what a real Christian is. And look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Hebrews 13, 2. It says this, do not forget to entertain strangers, 
for by so doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So you don't know who might be in your midst, who that person is that look just like a bum or doesn't seem like they got it all together, or maybe they look all together, whatever the case. Being hospitable and showing uh, a, a kind gesture, a warm smile, you might be dealing with an angel and don't even notice. Watch this. First John three fourteen tells us that we reflect. I'm trying to wind it down. Y'all be patient with me. I'm gonna try to knock out this last little bit. First John three fourteen. Says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. You say you're born again. You're a child of God. You walk in life. Love is the evidence of that. If you're saying that I am in light, I am in life, but I don't walk in love, that's an oxymoron. They don't go together. It reflects our discipleship, right? And we read that. Let me go back and reiterate. Look at John 13, 35. What does it say? By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. We read 34 that says a new commandment I give you. That's the evidence of being a true disciple. It's not how big your Bible is. It's not even how many times you go to church or how many scripture you know? The evidence of being a true disciple is demonstrating love. That's God's definition of love. God says, I'm not impressed with your big cross. I'm not impressed with how much money you gave. What shows me you're truly my disciple is the way that you love others. That's how the world is judging us because they're saying, how y'all say y'all Christians and then you treat people jacked up? We give a poor witness, a poor testimony of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that one of the biggest hindrances to people getting saved is us. Point to yourself and say, it might be me. <laughs> if we don't demonstrate love, why would somebody want to be a Christian? Why would I want to join? That's like you said, this lady, I, you've been around me, you probably heard this story before. This lady came to my house. She tried to convince me to sell, what was that thing? Something Williams, some kind of sales they had back in the day and they might still have it. But anyway, you know, life insurance and all this stuff. And and I remember looking at her and I, not that I had it all going on, but I do remember looking at her thinking her shoes don't look that great. Her clothes look a little rough. If she looking like that, I'm dressed better than her already. Why would why would I want to do what she's telling me to do? If you got it going on like you saying it's going on, you ought to look like it. If you're telling me that being in Christ is a blessing, and I ain't talking about material, I'm talking about your spiritual well-being. If people don't see any joy, any peace, any love, why would they want to be a Christian? So when I looked at her and she told me, oh, you can make all this money, and I'm looking at you, and, and I'm already dressed better than you do, you ain't convincing me. <laughs> A.W. Williams, I think it was called, something like that. Whatever the case, point is, you are the biggest billboard oftentimes that people are going to read. And your love will reflect Christ being real in the earth realm. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9. We're coming down the home stretch. As best say. I'm bringing my plane in for a landing. About to pull in the garage. First Thessalonians 4 9. And you might have to jot these down. First Corinthians 13, 3 through 8. You know that scripture, love, the, the love chapter and what it means to be loving, patient, kind, not puffed up, not self-seeking. First Thessalonians 4 and 9 says.
But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. You already know the new commandment. I don't need to tell you again, Paul is saying. You already know. God has already taught you. The word of God has taught you. Love one another. So when you walk in love, you're reflecting that you know what he taught you and that you're walking in obedience to it. And of course, 1 Corinthians 13, 3 through 8, read that. You're going to see all the definition of what love is and what love isn't. It's not just about how much can I prophesy. It's do I show patience? Am I kind? All of those are the evidences of love. And look at 1 John 3. I'm not even going to attempt to read all of that. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. But love it. Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies him just them, himself, just as he who him just as he is pure. And it goes on to talk about if we continue to practice sin then we're not abiding in God's love. Practice means constantly, repeatedly living a lifestyle that says, I'm not trying to do better. This is where I live now. That's not reflective of God's teaching or the fact that you abide in his love. When you fall, you get back up, even if you have to go and get help. Even if you have to turn down your play, even if you have to keep going to Bible study until you get that breakthrough, whatever it takes, but you'd never say, that's just how I am. God knows my heart. No, what he knows is you rejected what his word says and you're doing your own thing. When you surrender to God, you no longer practice sin. What does that mean? You are constantly growing up in Christ. Your ways are changed. Doesn't mean it all happens overnight. But over time, if in 20 years, you look the same you did 20 years ago from walking with God, something's out of order. I'm better. I'm not the best yet, but I'm better than I was. Those are reflections of the fact that I've been learning and applying his teaching so that I can be reflective of who he is in my life. So we care for unbelievers. What does that mean? We don't just <clears throat> give lip service. We provide for people's needs. And this can going to be applicable to believers as well. But this particular angle I'm looking at is because oftentimes we look at people who aren't in Christ and we don't treat them with um, concern. We only concern about the people we like. But Jesus was concerned about those who were in Christ who follow him and those who work. In, in James 2, it says, if a brother or sister, and this probably is more applicable because James tends, like John would speak to uh, believers, but this can also apply to unbelievers. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warm and feel, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? In other words, it's not enough for me to say, hope you feel better. Hope you, you know, even though I know you're hungry and I got some food I can give you, God bless you. No, I may not be able to give you a lot, but I might be able to give you a couple of cans of beans or something. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is that I can share that will help you if I'm able. Doesn't mean I have to go live in the street for you to eat. But it, a lot of us, as my father said, we ain't in no Miss Meal colleges. Our bodies can spare a pound or two. And we're in a position to be a blessing and we choose not. That's not God. God wants us to provide for one another's needs for believers and unbelievers. This would be applicable. But I was zoomed in really when I put unbelievers into this scripture. 
in Matthew chapter 9, they the Pharisees was growling at Jesus. They were mad at him because he was hanging out with sinners in their mind. Why he hanging out with them, them wine bibbers and those uh, tax collectors? But I wanted you to see this because sometimes we get so holy that we forget we came from somewhere. We can't deal with nobody who's not saved anymore. Now, that doesn't mean I go hang out with them and do all the stuff they do, but I still should have time to spend with somebody who doesn't know Christ. How will I ever get to see a believer if I don't spend some time with them and share some love with them? Verse 9 in chapter 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to them, follow me. So he rode and followed him. Now it happened that Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors, tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. How am I going to reach sinners if I only hang around people in church? You got to get out of that pew sometime. Take some time. Go talk to the homeless. Talk to somebody who maybe doesn't look or doesn't know Christ. Spend some time with those relatives who are lost. Let them see the love of God in you. Doesn't mean you become like them, but you model Christ before them. He didn't get up and leave. Oh, my God. Oh, Father, I'm around these sinners and tax collectors. No, he hung out, him and his disciples. That's how Matthew became a disciple. Matthew wrote this book. Okay, and likewise, in Luke 15, it talks about that same thing, how Jesus hung around with the uh, sinners and the Pharisees got mad. Okay. You can write this down, 1 John 3, 23 and 24, Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. And you'll see other examples of what God had in mind or has in mind for how we are to live. It's not just rally with the troops. If I can only be light in light, then my light isn't very much. If I can only be a Christian around Christians, then that doesn't say much about my faith. Being a Christian should stand up. One of the things I do want to read is 1 John 3, 24. And this speaks to why, that mean I got to go hang out at the club, but why I can be around unbelievers and be okay. It says, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. When the Holy Spirit lives in me, he don't pack up on Sunday and leave, and then he show up again when I get back to church. No, the spirit that's abiding in me will be reflected wherever I go. People should see that and know that there is a God in me. All right, so we made it. Praise God. But one of the things that's critical is this. If you want to walk in Christ and walk in love, you got to know him for yourself. You got to walk in love for yourself. I want you to take a picture of this uh, list of scripture. And I want you to remember it, share it with others. God loves us. Matter of fact, he loved us first. That's what 1 John 4, 9 and 10 tells us. You didn't wake up one day and he said, okay, now you're acceptable. While you were still a sinner, he loved you. It says, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. While we were still nasty and sinful, he sent his son to die for our sins. That's what propitiation means. He's the appeasement. He's the price. He's the uh, the token that was given as the payment for the sin that we committed because we know from romans 1 and 10 all fall short all sin there's none righteous before god and we know that 
it's because through Adam, the first man, sin entered the world. And then death came with it. But God sent his only son, Romans 8 said, 5, 8 tells us he demonstrated his love for us by sending his son. That's love. God doesn't just ask us to love and demonstrate. He demonstrated love to model it before us. Romans 3.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Thank you, Jesus. He paid that sin. He paid for your sin. Romans 6.23, even though the wages of sin is death, the word of God tells us in Romans 6.23 that he came to earth to pay for that sin. He came and satisfied that obligation. In him, we have life. Let me read it to you so you can hear it for yourself. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And pardon me, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. That means the consequence for your sin is death. But Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. And he says, it's a gift. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That means you can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't keep all the rules of the law and get it. The only way to get it is to receive it as a gift. That Christmas morning trying to earn the packages your mom gave you for you. Santa Claus left or daddy left or whoever you in your mind think left that morning as a kid. No, you came down and tore that bag up, tore that package up. Because you know it was a gift. Jesus is the gift. Eternal life is the package that he brings. When you accept Jesus, you accept eternal life. You accept that all of your sins are forgiven. You accept that you will spend your eternity with him. And you accept the unending love of God. How do you do it? Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth and the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13, because all who say, who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And 1 John 5, 11 is so powerful. He says, you may know you have eternal life. You know, you ever heard people say, well, nobody can really know if they have eternal life. That's not what the Bible says. You can know, because God made it very plain. Look at it. He says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things are written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. So you can know, you can know, just like you can know you pregnant. You take the test, you yes or no. You know you got COVID, you take the test, yes or no. Well, guess what? You know you're saved. You either got Jesus or you don't. If you've accepted him, you're saved. And if you didn't, you aren't. It ain't complicated. So the bottom line is this, is there anybody who now realizes you can't walk in God's love the way he wants you to because you never accepted him for yourself, first of all. You never accepted that love for yourself. If you want to accept Jesus as your savior, today is the day to do that. Today is the day God set you up. He brought you here for the very purpose of letting you know that he loves you with an unconditional love and he wants you to be saved.